Hey, today we're looking at things up close. Hi, welcome to Snapshot, the show that's all about taking better photos, taking better video. I'm your host, Dennis Rule, and in this episode, I've got a great tutorial for you to help you get started in micro photography or macro, depending on the brand of cameras that you're using. Uh, one manufacturer calls it micro, the other one calls it macro. They're really the same thing. Uh, we also have a review on a super telephoto lens. So we're going to the other end of the extreme. This is a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. You'll want to check out some of the high res photos that I have to show you. And um, I really enjoyed working with this lens. So I hope you enjoy the review. So sit back, relax, check it out. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get a notification every time we put out a new video. So let's check out the tutorial. So here we are in the studio. We're going to do a macro shot today. We're going to do a close-up shot, uh, something a little bit different, something a lot of fun. Uh, camera of choice today is going to be the Nikon D7200. I've chosen this camera because it's an APS camera and it's going to give me um, a bit wider or a longer depth of field. Um, not as shallow as a full-frame camera or bigger. So the smaller your sensor, uh, the more depth of field you have. It's just one of those things. Um, going to use a 60 millimeter uh, macro lens. Uh, this is the older model. It's not the latest model, but hey, it's still working great. Uh, it's f2.8 and uh, works fantastic. I love this lens. So we're going to use that. I've got my camera mounted on a tripod because when we're doing macro photography, um, you know, you want to try and hold your focus. You don't want to be moving in and out. It, uh, just a tiny little movement is huge. So you don't want the camera to go out of focus. Using a tripod helps a lot. Um, camera settings, it's going to be in the manual mode and, or sorry, it's going to be in the aperture priority mode. And I'm going to choose F16 and I've already dialed it in to ISO 800 so the camera can uh, do the work from itself. Uh, very clean camera, very clean pixels, so at ISO 800 I'm not worried about noise at all. Okay, here's the subject of today's photography. It's coloring pencils. I stopped at the dollar store, got these, and uh, it's, it's a really easy shot. I've done a couple of things. First off, I've taken all of the gold marks and I've put them underneath because I don't want the light reflecting on those. That makes for a cleaner shot. I've mounted them in here in uh, what's called a magic clamp. And uh, these are really cool because uh, it's just a clamp. You can use it for product. You can use it to hold reflectors. You can use it to hold backgrounds. Uh, it's very, very neat. And um, it's adjustable, okay? So I can move that one back and forth this way. I put it onto a second uh, clamp here. Um, actually, it's an umbrella holder. So now that uh, with the spigot, I can move that this way and I can move them any which way I want so I can orient the, uh, the pencils and the light and get my shot. So basically we're going to put those with the, uh, with the gray background and we're going to need to light it up. So I'm going to use the Luma light from Aurora Light Bank. This is a battery powered LED light. Now these are pretty cool. You may not know it, but we use these in the studio all the time. We've got them for doing all of our video shoots and I'm using them constantly to do products. So it's got a battery pack. This is a 10 amp hour battery pack. Uh, this is an LED light and LEDs work a little bit different than tungsten lighting, but we're all used to tungsten lighting. So in tungsten lighting, this would be a 1000 watt light. In LED terms, it's a 100 watt light, uh, almost a 10 times to one ratio. Um, at the back here, we've got a power button. We've got our intensity dial and we've got uh, all, some LEDs that tell us the battery condition. And while we're speaking of the battery condition, at full power, this battery will power this light for 80 minutes, roughly, give or take, depending on the temperature. Um, but to be honest with you, I never run it at that power. I'm always between one quarter and one third. And at those power levels, I can run this all day, eight hours in the studio, not a problem. Um, another cool thing about, uh, well, there's a couple of cool things about LED lights. First of all, um, they're cool. Uh, there's no um, heat. Or very little. I mean, you can hold your hand on there all day long, you're not going to burn yourself. And if you were a user of tungsten lights, you know that after about 25 hours, they start to lose their color or they burn out. And with LEDs, that's not the case. 
These are um, 55K balanced and they're 95 CRI. Now we're going to get into CRI in a second, but um, the 55K is the fact that it's daylight balanced, so it's the same as looking at daylight. Um, CRI, to make it easy for you to understand, uh, here's an example. You take a print and you're going to go out to the window or you're going to step outside so you can see the color 100% so you know that the colors are right. When you look at it under the fluorescent light or under uh, a cheap ceiling light, you're looking at it and you don't know if you've got your color bang on. You take it outside and then you know. This is that case where the 95 CRI, it's the color rendering index, it's the amount of color that you can see the spectrum of the light and it's an easy way to measure it. A really cheap light, LED light, will have 87 CRI. And the difference between 87 and CRI and 95 CRI is, is miles, miles and miles apart. It's uh, exponential. There's all kinds of uh, information that you can find on the internet. I'm not going to make it an entire video on CRI, but just know that the higher the number, uh, the, more rendi the more color rendering you're going to get. All right, we take this off. This is a bowl reflector. You can see that the panel here is flat. I'm going to turn it on facing this way. This thing's awfully bright. I don't want to face it right into the lens of the camera here, but you can see that it's very bright. It's very white and it's actually, if I can dim this right down, right down to, to where we can start seeing it in the camera. I'm watching the monitor at the same time. All right, you can see that there's no hot spot in here. It's, it's fully well illuminated. It's homogenous. Um, so with having this little um, diffuser right in front, it makes your light very, very even to start with. All right, the bowl reflector. You'll notice that there's a uh, three knobs on it. Um, this is a bayonet mount or S bayonet mount. Uh, same thing, people call it the Bowens mount. Um, so you can mount almost anything on this head. Um, there's stuff available all over the place. So you can use uh, bowls, speed rings, um, snoots, beauty dishes, soft boxes. Everything that you could possibly buy that would fit uh, the Bowens mount is going to fit on here. So you just pop it in, give it a twist, and you're done. All right, you're ready to shoot. So that's it. We've got our uh, coloring pencils here. We're going to light it up. So bear with me. We're going to turn off the lights in the studio and um, we'll get right to it because I don't want any lights on here at all. In constant light, what you see is what you get. So I want to make sure that uh, you're going to be seeing exactly the same thing. Now I may be blown out a little bit on the video camera because I'm in the automatic mode for the aperture. Um, so it may blow things out just ever so slightly, but once you see the photos, it's going to be perfect. All right, we'll be right back. Okay, the studio lights are off and you can see exactly what I'm seeing here with the camera. And as I come in here and, and take a shot, first of all, I've got my camera a little bit too close. So I'm just going to back it off a little bit. And I'm going to put my focus point, um, which I've also got my focus point set up on my, uh, on my light meter here, to be right above the yellow on this pencil here, uh, right on the, the uh, shaved part of the wood so that I can get a balanced light right across and we'll take a shot from there and see how we do. We're at f16. It's looking pretty good. It's a little bit overexposed because I'm throwing so much light very close here. So I'm just going to go into my exposure compensation and I'm going to try taking it down two thirds of a stop here. Let's see how we do. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Uh, I could actually maybe even go to one third of a stop. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that's actually, a, that's got it pretty much bang on and I could always check it. Now, often I will use a, um, I will use a, um, a monitor so I can see it right off my computer. But today uh, I'll just take a peek at the histogram and the histogram looks good. So we'll take a, another quick shot here uh, just so that I have a reference. Yep, everything's cool. So you can see that I've got a black background. Um, my pencils, I've got kind of a cool art showing up here. Um, but I want to take it a step further than that. I want to get um, a little bit more happening on the background. So I'm going to step over here and turn on my second Luma light. Now I've got a grid in here. We'll take that off first and we'll just turn that on and we'll see what's happening here. 
you can see right off the bat that my background is, is pretty well lit now. I've got that gray look. And when I take a shot, uh, you can actually see that I've got a bit of a hot spot in there. And I can actually even make out, because of the angle that my light's at, I can actually make out some of the wrinkles in my paper. So let's see if we can tighten that up. What we're going to do is grab a grid. And a grids are really kind of cool. This is a 20 degree grid. And I'm just going to show you through the camera here that as I look at the grid, you can see the light through it. And as I turn the grid, my hand's disappearing. That's because the honeycomb surface, and it just, what that does is it channels the light. It directs the light and, and focuses it into a small beam. And so you can see exactly on the background now that I've got a beam of light that's much smaller and easier to control. And I actually have a pretty neat gradient going on here. So if I take another shot, well, it took a couple of them there, but that's okay. Uh, you can see that I've got kind of a gradient of light going across, and that's kind of cool. But we'll take another step further, and you know I've been working with uh, gels quite a bit lately. So here's a piece of blue gel. Now I got this at a theatrical store, a DJ supply store, sound and lighting spot. Some of the, uh, some of the video shops carry it as well, and some of the camera stores, of course. Now quite often the camera store is the video store as well, with, these, uh, with the DSLRs now being the way they are, that shoot video. That's really cool. So you can see that my background has turned blue and I haven't touched the intensity. And you probably noticed that um, it's quite a bit darker than it was before. Um, that's because the gels tend to eat up a little bit of light. So let's take a shot and see what's happening. And I've got just that little glow of blue in the background, which I kind of like, but just to show you guys that by changing the intensity of the shot, I can bring my background way up, or my background light up, <laughs> not way up, but up. And I've got a different look there. And I can blow it out to a little bit more light here. And again, a different look. So it all depends on what you're after. I personally like just a little subtle hint. And just to finish off the shot, what we're going to do is we're going to grab a uh, two-in-one reflector. Now this one's got a sil uh, white side and a silver side and I'm just going to hand hold that right here and throw a little bit of pop of light on the side of the pencils and just so that we can wrap it around and we take our shot and there you have it. Fully wrapped around light and a pretty easy to do photo and you can do this with all kinds of different lights. The LEDs make it really, really simple, but any continuous light source will work. Uh, you just may not get uh, the same color rendition as you will with the Aurora lights. So I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. This week I got to work with Tamron's latest super telephoto lens, the SP 150 to 600 millimeter lens. Now it's F5 through F6.3. Uh, DI, VC for vibration control, USD for its coatings, and um, pretty impressive. I have to say um, I was a little bit skeptical of a lens this long uh, because as a portrait shooter, it's not really something that I would use, but I really did want to try it. So here's what my initial thoughts. It's awesome. For the price, it's amazing. Um, I do have a couple little pet peeves, but uh, they are far outweighed by the positives. One of the things that I really, really found handy was this lock, which is on uh, many of Tamron's lenses. And what the lock does is it, it stops the lens from uh, extending when you're carrying it downwards because the lens is so large and heavy that uh, putting on the lock uh, stops the lens from opening. And I thought that was a really cool thing. Um, it's just a really handy feature to have. Now, I'll just take this down here. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the features on the side here. Um, we've got our focus chase, which is what I call it. Um, it's a switch that allows the uh, lens to go from uh, a full sweep of focus uh, to 15 meters or infinity, uh, 15 meters to infinity. So uh, just by switching that, it's it's how much the lens searches for focus. And that can be really, really helpful in a lot of circumstances. Uh, next, you have your manual focus, automatic focus, and uh, lastly on the bottom, your uh, vibration control shift, 
to turn it on or turn it off. If you're working on a tripod, there's no need to have vibration control. It also slows down your autofocus or your 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 um, shutter speed, not the shutter speed of the camera, but the speed at which the cam the uh, lens locks on and allows you to take a photo. Um, so if you're looking for a faster response, you'll need to turn that off, but it's a big lens. So you better be uh, shooting at a high shutter speed and, you know, definitely on a, on a tripod is, uh, it is almost a must if you're going to turn off the vibration control. I used a monopod for my test and it doesn't really need it. You can hand hold the lens fine. And I did on, on one or two occasions, but the reason I use the monopod is just because it's so large and I'm waiting for the right moment that it, the monopod is really nice. That gives you something to rest the lens on and, uh, you know, you can move it about now. Here's one of my pet peeves. Actually, it's not really a hundred percent pet peeve, but uh, on here there is a lock for the ring. So you can go from portrait mode to, um, uh, sorry, from portrait mode to landscape mode. And uh, I just found that this thing here, it, it's, it's clunky. Um, it, it doesn't have, I thought maybe it was a locking section, but it's just clunky. It just doesn't feel nice. And when you're moving it, um, if you've got a little bit of tension on here, I found that it, it bound on me a few times uh, when I was moving it around. So that's my only real uh, thing that I I just didn't like. Actually, there was one other that I found a little bit um, a little bit unnerving, and that's the fact that the um, that the lens uh, locking ring to the camera I thought was just a little bit loose. Now a lot of them have some play. But this being such a big lens that it's just amplified. Now I'm sure it's fine. The lens has been around. Photo-wise, it's it's ex excellent. Um, I pushed the lens to its limit. I uh, went one day to the airport. Let's pop some photos up on that. And I went another day just to a local park. And um, the second, on my return from the local park, um, I stopped in an industrial area just to see if I could get some long distance, uh, just change the aperture and you'll see that the, um, the settings are, are displayed on the photos there. Other thoughts, the lens hood, uh, very, very handy. It comes with it. Um, it's, it's fine. It works fine. It, it snaps in place. Very, very easy to line up. There's a set of dots that you just line up with the dots that are on top of the lens. So that was easy. Um, the lens cap or the filter size on this one here, 95 millimeter. Uh, so you're going to uh, have to uh, put a little bit of investment in a, feet, in, in a filter in order to protect the lens. But um, other than that, I think this is an amazing lens for the price. Um, very, very sharp. It's very quiet. Fairly fast focusing for such a long focus uh, focal length. Um, I was impressed. Overall, thumbs up. Now, I'm not being paid by Tamron uh, to do this test. It's just my review. Uh, Tamron Canada did send me the lens to, uh, to use. Unfortunately, uh, the courier company uh, kind of let us down. It was supposed to be here overnight. And for some reason, it took three days to get here. So that cut down that I only had two afternoons where I could go out and shoot. And I'm actually rushing this uh, review now because I've got to pack up the lens and send it back. So there you have it. That's my impressions of the Tamron 150 to 600. If you're a nature lover or you're a sports enthusiast, you're going to love having this in your gear bag. Hey, well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed putting it together for you. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook. And don't forget about our website, snapshotshow.com. You'll find the high-res photos that we have in this episode in the photo gallery there. So you can go and take a look at them up close and, and kind of scrutinize them a little bit higher res than you see on YouTube. So with that, don't forget to get out there and shoot lots. Pixels are free and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now.